Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you. When you uh, came in, you received a bulletin this morning. You're going to need that for a couple of purposes. One, it, it uh, is, has the scriptures we're going to look at today, a place where you can jot some things down, and two, it makes an excellent fan if I go too long. So keep that handy. I want to pray, and then we're going to uh, go on a journey today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your grace and your love. We thank you for how you work when we let you work. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did for us that one day. We just pray, Lord God, that as we spend some time in your word today, as we kind of think through the journey and uh, think through all that Jesus Christ did for us on that morning, I just pray that you would speak to our spirits, that you would help us understand your eternal and never-ending love for us, and that you would also help us, Lord God, to take steps closer to you, to release control, to release our plans, to release our agendas, and trust you for our lives. So I just thank you for everyone who's here today, and just pray, Lord God, now that you would, you would help us this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're doing things a little different today, and that's because we're going to go on a kind of a hike together. Is everybody ready for a hike? Yeah. All right. It's only about 115 outside. And so we're going to go on this hike together, and the hike begins and ends one day. It starts on a morning after Jesus has been condemned to die by the Roman governor, Pilate. The hike, this journey we're going to go on, begins at a palace and ends at a graveyard. And as we walk on this hike, we're going to experience from a distance as observers, what Jesus went through that day, he was condemned. The hike begins very early in the morning and goes close to the evening. It's not a long hike in distance, only about half a mile, but there are four different stops, four locations along the way. We're going to go at those locations the other thing I want to tell you about the hike is that this hike, this journey that Jesus went on is also a journey that you and I have to go on. Not just today walking through the different areas that he went through, the different locations, but it's a hike, a journey that we have to be willing to trust God to follow. Jesus never tried to get people to be more religious. Do you know that? Jesus never said... Uh, hey, I'm going to teach you all of the rules and regulations that you need to follow. He never called people to steps for a successful life. That was never what Jesus was about. Jesus had only one calling ever when he would talk to people as he walked the earth. And the calling was this, follow me. And today we're going to see what it looks like to follow Jesus a little bit closer up maybe than we have in the past. Now, as we go on this hike and we go to these four different locations, these four stops along the way of this journey, we're going to sing four songs. And the songs are intended to kind of help us focus and get our minds and our hearts kind of wrapped around what Jesus went through. I don't want this to be kind of a highly intellectual time. I don't want this to be just sort of a, okay, here's the four things. I really want this to be a journey that we go on together through the streets of Jerusalem back about 30 A.D. after Jesus was condemned to die. The crowds had turned their backs and called for his crucifixion. The Roman governor found himself in a tight spot and so condemned him to his death. He was taken back inside of a place called the Praetorium. The Praetorium is simply the house of the Praetor which means a leader. It was a palace. Jesus was shown to the crowds, sentenced to death, and Roman guards took him and began the process of crucifixion. But before that began, they took him back inside the palace, the praetorium. Now they had him at their mercy. And because they were in a place as Roman citizens, an occupied area, in Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, they had no real rules or regulations monitoring how they would treat 
people who were sentenced. So they brought Jesus in, called in some of the other guards, and began to say, let's have some fun with this one. The scripture tells us that when they took Jesus in, they began to mock him, and they began to beat him. If you look at your outline, it says this. They, that's the Roman guards, put a purple robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. The first thing they did with this man who had the sentence to die of being someone who was a king, which meant he must be someone who would rebel against Caesar, is they went over to their own stuff and they grabbed an old beat-up purple robe. Every Roman guard had to wear a purple robe. Purple was the color of royalty. So those particular guards would wear purple showing that they were the praetorian guards. They guarded royalty. So they took an old, beat-up, sweaty, dirty robe. Now remember, Jesus has been scourged. His back was laid bare. Strips of skin were hanging off of him, and he'd lost a lot of blood. It was beginning to go into shock. They took the purple robe, and they threw it over him. In Jerusalem, there are all kinds of bushes that grow. There are thorns everywhere, like there are in our deserts. They took some of those thorns, probably growing right around the praetorium, cut them off with their knife, and began to fashion them. People tell us that the thorns are about three inches long. They crammed it on his head, and it began to go into his skin. And then as he was looking at, ridiculous with this old beat-up dirty robe on him and this crown of thorns on him, they began to say, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the king of the Jews. He's going to lead the Jewish people. What a joke. Who does he think he is? And they had no idea they were really crowning and robing the king of heaven and earth that was going to die for them. And the scripture tells us they took a staff. People think it could have been a, a hard reed that they used to put in his hand and say, oh, here's your scepter, your royal highness. But after a while, they, they took the rod and they just began to beat him. They beat him on the head. They beat him on the rear. They beat him on the legs. They beat him, and they beat him, and they beat him. They had to hold his arms, apparently, because the beating was so severe, he would have dropped unconscious if they did. Then they bowed down, and they began to worship him. Oh, hail king! Finally, they brought him back up. They grabbed the robe that was now adhered to his back by blood, and they ripped it off his back. Why was Jesus there? Why was the king of heaven and earth there? I want you to write down this first word. It's the word choice. The word choice. And I want you to let that word sink into your spirits today, you guys. Choice. The king of heaven and earth, the one who had come to die for all people, was there because he'd made a choice. And the choice was this. He had chosen to seek the approval of God, his Father in heaven, instead of choosing to seek the approval of the world around him. You know, when Jesus, that week before he was arrested, was coming into Jerusalem, thousands of people, historians think tens of thousands of people, were cheering him, saying, Hosanna in the highest, here comes our Messiah. Throughout his time, the scriptures and historians inform us that there were thousands, tens of thousands, every city he went to, people believed in him, people trusted in him, and he could have rallied all of that energy, kind of political style, and gotten those people to come around him. And even beyond that, he's the king of heaven and earth. He could have called all the angels of heaven and earth to defend him. And as by doing that, all these angels coming and lifting him up and saying, you will not touch our king, the whole world would have been shown how great he was and how wrong they were. And they would have given him approval as the true God. 
But his desire wasn't approval from the world. It wasn't approval from the people around him. He didn't want their praise and their honor. He made a choice to follow the Father wherever it led him. Because even though it seemed like the darkest day in history and the whole world had turned their back on him, the Father in heaven was looking down and was smiling on him, giving him that approval. If I'll follow Jesus, i got to make a choice. Do I want the world to praise me? Do I want people to think I'm great because I fit right in and do everything that seems to be what the world wants? Or will I say, no, i I got one life and I want that life to have the approval of the Father. And wherever it takes me, and whatever people say about me as I walk with Him, and I promise you, just like Jesus, if you walk in this path, the world at times will mock you too. But as they mock, the Father's looking at you saying, you've got my approval. I approve of you. I love you. I cherish you. And though people around you may be saying, no, no good, the Father is saying, You're, you please me. I'm pleased with you. If I'd follow Jesus, I got a choice to make. First word is choice. After the guards had had their way with Jesus, a detail of four guards with a centurion, kind of an officer type, took Jesus and began to walk him out of the city about half a mile to a place called Golgotha, which we'll talk about in a moment. About half a mile away. As they walked him out that day, it was part of the process, part of the humiliation, that the condemned man would have to carry the crossbeam of the cross called the patabellum. Let go. The patabellum could weigh about 100 pounds. They would lash the man's arms to the patabellum, and then he would proceed along with any other condemned men as the people in the city would spit at them, would curse at them, would cheer the fact that they were going to their death. As Jesus walked along that day, he had received so many beatings, had lost so much blood, was going into such deep shock that he was not capable of carrying his own cross. This was a man who had walked all over the Judean and Israeli countryside. This was a man, until the age of 30, was a carpenter. He was strapping. He was strong. He could certainly pick up more than 100 pounds easily. He was 30 years old. But because of the beatings, he wasn't even capable of doing that. He was, he was so weak. He was so worn out. And as he walked and tried to carry it, he dropped it. Come on, boy. It fell on him, crushing him. So the Romans, recognizing they need to get him to the place where he'll be crucified, pushed a man, pressed a man, a Jew from Africa who was in Jerusalem to celebrate the holy days. They pressed him into service and made him pick up the cross of Jesus, the patabellum that Jesus would be nailed to, and forced him to carry it that distance up to where he'd be crucified. If you've got your outline, the scripture describes it to us. It says a certain man from Cyrene, that's in Africa. Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. And they forced him to carry the cross. Now, I like that Mark mentions Alexander and Rufus. 
They were Christians. Mark writes about 70 AD, some 40 years after all this had taken place, and he says, in effect, hey, you know those two brothers that you guys know, Alexander and Rufus, well-known Christians among us? Well, they're well-known not because of what they'd done, but because of something that happened to their father who's long gone, who's passed away long ago. Simon had the honor of bearing the burden of Jesus. The word I want you to write down now is the word community. It seemed like Jesus was all alone. The crowds who had cheered his name seven days before had turned on him and called for his death. The Romans wanted nothing to do with a man who had claimed to be a king and therefore maybe caused some kind of rebellion or riot against, against Rome who had occupied Israel. His own disciples, even his closest friend, Peter, who had promised to stand by him, even if it required him to die along with Jesus, had run away like a scared child when the pressure really got turned on. And it seemed like Jesus was all by himself that day. He was completely alone, or so it looked. But what no one could understand that day, as Jesus was too weak, to do what the Father had called him to do. The Father worked in his own way and raised up a godly man to stand beside Jesus and to carry his burden. That's how community works. God never calls you to follow Jesus alone. He never calls you to carry out the burdens that you have in ministry, in life, alone. And when you are too weak To walk with the Lord, you're struggling from your own issues. You're struggling from things other people are doing. As the Lord ministers to you, He'll raise up women. He'll raise up men to stand by you, to help you, and to carry your burden. And as you walk with other people who follow Jesus, and they fall once and twice and are pressed by weight and can't get up, God sends you as a blessing to help pick up their burden and to carry it with them. That's what community looks like. What a tragedy when we turn on other believers who are struggling. What a tragedy when we don't help those who are are heavy burdened and just too weak to go any further. God calls us a family, and in family we help one another. The word here is community. Though it looked like a crowd of people cheering for the death of the, of the criminals, there were two other men with Jesus who were condemned to die that day and were ultimately crucified that morning. Though it looked like the whole world was against Jesus, yet because the Father's presence was there, Jesus shared a moment of community. And in that community, he walked along beside a man whom he was going to die for, named Simon, who bared his burden. Look at what the scripture says. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If you did the research, you'd find out the law of Christ can be summed up in one word, love. Love looks like carrying someone's burden when they're just too weak to carry it themselves. Well, how's your journey so far? It's pretty exhausting, isn't it? It's amazing to think of what Jesus did for us, and about this time on the hike, I'm ready to get a nice bottle of water and sit under a shade tree and relax a little bit, but that's not how it goes. When we walk with God, He knows the limits that we can go to. He knows how to provide for us way beyond the limits we set for ourselves and to carry us into a new kind of place that we wouldn't otherwise probably go. For Jesus, he now was being walked up outside of the city of Jerusalem to a place called Golgotha. Golgotha is kind of a uh, twisted term out of Aramaic that means skull. Skull place or skull 
hill. No one knows exactly why it's called that. Historians think it had to do maybe because that was the designated place where they would kill criminals by crucifixion. Others think that it is because if you look at it even today, 2,000 years later with all the erosion, if you get just right and look at it, it looks at the, the base of that hill like there's the face of a skull, a skull imprint large on the side of that. If that's true, I don't know, no one knows, but if it is true, it made a perfect place for them to kill their criminals. So Jesus was marched up to Skull Place along with the two other condemned men and the detachments of Roman guards and crowds who would have gone along in procession, booing, cursing, shouting how glad they were that God had had vengeance on them. It was quite the spectacle. Now as the criminals arrived there, those detachments of soldiers would unstrap them from the patabellum and lay it down on the ground. Then they would force the man down on top of it with a soldier on either side. One would hold this arm and one over here on this arm, pressing down on the top of the man's palm so he couldn't move. Another guard would stand guard with a spear so that no one tried to interrupt because if you see a family member crucified, you might charge in. It was your certain death if you did. Most people knew that, so they just stayed back and watched. Sometimes cheering and jeering, sometimes in absolute horror. The third soldier would then take spikes, the ones that had been found by archaeologists are about six inches long, they didn't put them through the palms. They put them through the wrist because you have bones there that are able to support your weight. And they would begin to drive the spike. And with each drive of the nail, the nail would crush the median nerve that runs through both arms. It was unbelievably agonizing and painful. Our English word, excruciation. Like someone says, I, this is, the pain was excruciating. Comes from a word that means out of the cross or from the cross. It was excruciating pain. His nails were being driven into his hands. You'd hear that slamming and that clanging going on for these three criminals. You would hear sobbing, you would hear screaming, you would hear cursing. The Bible describes it. If you want to look at your outline again, it says they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Then they offered wine to him mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. Now, as a condemned criminal, obviously you had no rights, particularly under Roman law. You were not crucified as the pictures, the Renaissance pictures, or the things you find at the Christian bookstore show where Jesus had some kind of you know, covering on. You were stripped bare. Every worldly possession you had, right down to your smallest inner garment, was taken from you. It was part of the humiliation of the criminal to kill them being naked. But sometimes they had clothing or personal possessions that had value, so it was typical for that detachment of four soldiers to take whatever that prisoner had left on him and to play dice cast lots to see who would get what. Now sometimes if it was just some kind of garment that had value, they could rip it into four pieces and all get a little bit from it. But Jesus had a particular outer garment that was sewn in one piece and they decided not to rip that up but to, to just throw dice to see who would get that. That had a little bit of value. As the prisoners were in this pain... 
Jesus was offered wine mixed with myrrh. Myrrh is basically just a resin that they get out of a tree that grows in that part of the world, and they take it and they dry it and they smash it and powder it. It's still used in herbal medicines today, but the thing that myrrh has, along with the wine, which would have been very cheap, almost vinegar wine, that the guards, a, a typical Roman soldier would have drank, is that it would intoxicate you very, very quickly. And so the idea was, as we're crucifying him, and he's feeling fire from those median nurse shooting through his body and, and eventually once they, they lift up the patabellum with his whole weight on it and set it down on top of that spike which was permanently fixed in the ground that as it dropped onto that spike both shoulders would become dislocated. Then they would gather his feet together and drive usually a single spike from what archaeologists have found through the bones of his heels to, to help support his weight. And the way crucifixion worked is not by pain or by blood loss. It is that as you hung on the cross, you could breathe in. But to breathe out, you had to push yourself up on that nail. And as you breathed out, you'd feel the pain shooting through your body. And it would cause you to drop back down. And you'd breathe in again. Historians tell us that a person could stay on the cross for two or three days. So the guards would take that cheap wine, they'd mix it with a little powdered myrrh, and they'd offer it to just eliminate a little bit of the suffering. I'm guessing if any one of us were there, I would have wanted all I could get of it. Jesus refused to drink a single drop The word I want you to write down now for skull place, the darkest, most unimaginably terrible place. I want you to write the word embrace. Embrace. Jesus was there because he chose to embrace the Father's will wherever that took him. He didn't even want a bit of the pain to be deadened. It was what the Father had for him. He wasn't going to try and skirt around and get away from what the Father had for him in any way. He wasn't going to try and say, okay, I've done enough, I've done enough, I've done enough. When the Father leads you and me, we may go to places that are very dark, Sometimes God calls us to do things, to step into places that seem very frightening, very much alone. I know what mine have been. I don't know what yours are. But I know that when a pastor stands up and starts talking about, if you follow Jesus, uh, you'll get a bigger house, you'll make more money, and your husband will start becoming attractive looking to you again. Consider him a liar. When you follow Jesus, you'll go through the valley of the shadow of death. You'll go to Skull Place. And you may face pain. You may face emotional pain. You may face relational pain. The only question is, will I try to skirt around it or will I embrace what the Father has for me? Knowing that this is His plan, and in the midst of this, there's going to be good. The Scripture says this, in fact, these are the very words of Jesus. He said this earlier in His ministry to people who wanted Him to be their king because they thought it would benefit them that they would have everything their hearts desired, including freedom from those Romans who had occupied their beloved Israel. Jesus said, in effect, no, it doesn't work like that. If you want to crown me king because you think I'll then give you everything you want, you're wrong. I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, you know, the, the holy vending machine. 
She put in a little praise, and I give you whatever you want. I, I have great plans for you and great glory, great provision, great freedom like you've never experienced, great joy and peace beyond your wildest dreams. But don't look to me if you're just wanting to get your way. You'll have to embrace what the Father has for you just as I'm embracing. And he said these words to them. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus tells us that as we walk with him, there'll be places of pain. There'll be skull hills for us to ascend. Now we'll have the Lord being very pleased as we trust him step by step. We'll have community along the way that helps us when we're just too weak to take steps on our own. God doesn't leave us alone. He's with us every step of the way. He provides for us so that there's light, even in the darkest times. But He can only really work through me, and I can only really follow the Savior if I'm willing to embrace whatever His will is for me on any given day. We're in the third location. Jesus is now hanging on a cross with a man on his right on the cross and a man on his left. Now, it was very typical, like I said, for criminals to hang up there for days. Eventually, they would be torn apart by animals and birds as a further way of humiliating them and saying by the Romans, this is what happens to all criminals who come against Rome. Once they finally took down what was left of them, they would dig a pit somewhere outside of the city and throw their remains in that pit. This particular day was during the high holy days for Israel. That night at 6, that evening, was going to be an important time for the Jews. And they did not want criminals hanging outside of their city after 6 o'clock. It was a time for them now to worship the Lord. And so they went to Pilate and they said, could you please get those criminals down? Well, the criminals, of course, were still alive. So the process to hurry up the crucifixion was to take heavy clubs. A guard would go up to each criminal and smash their kneecaps. When they did, the criminal would drop and was not able to push up anymore because of the broken legs. They did that to the man on the right and they did that to the man on the left and then suffocation came very, very quickly because they could no longer push up. When they went to Jesus to smash his legs, they found he had already died, which was surprising. It had only been about six hours. But he had fulfilled the Father's will. He had carried out everything the Father had called him to do. And so the scripture says that as he had done that, he surrendered his life over to the Father. It was a fulfillment of prophecy that no one that day could have possibly understood. Because the scripture hundreds and hundreds of years before said that though the Messiah would die for his people, not one bone would be broken. And so a bone wasn't broken that day, though it was of the other criminals. Well, knowing that the time of celebration that evening was coming, there was a man a man named Joseph, a very prominent man, a very important man in the city. In fact, he was part of the council known as the Sanhedrin that we've talked about in the past, the council that tried Jesus the night before had condemned him of blasphemy, saying he was the Messiah, saying even he would be returning with the Father in glory to condemn any who came against the Father's will. This man was there and saw it all happen. He was part of the Sanhedrin, one of the most prominent members of all of Jewish society. 
But in his heart, he knew who Jesus really was. Though he had hidden his appreciation and love and even belief in Jesus, though he had said to his friends, no, 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 I, I, you know, I, I go along with you, whatever you think. Though he had cowered before for fear of the world around him, for fear of his, his friends on the Sanhedrin, for fear of being cast out, not just from the Sanhedrin, but from access to the temple where he worshipped, and even from his own synagogue. For fear he had kept his mouth closed about what he truly believed. But finally it was more than he could bear. He couldn't tolerate it anymore. So he moved that cloak of fear, of secrecy, and in courage, he went to the most powerful man in the land, Pontius Pilate, who had condemned Jesus to die. And he said, I'd like your permission, governor, to take the body of Jesus. Don't throw him in the pit with the others. I'd like to have his body. My intention is to bury him. Now, Pilate couldn't believe he was already dead. Even after they had smashed their legs and knees, it took a little bit of time for them to die of suffocation. So Pilate asked soldier by him, is this the case? Is, is he really dead? Yes, he's dead. Pilate said, have your way. I don't care. So Joseph went as they were lowering now the dead criminals down, taking the pat of vellum off of the spike that's permanently stayed in the ground and were ripping the nails out so they could take their bodies and throw them in the ditch. Joseph came, an elderly man, an important man, a prominent and wealthy man, and humbled himself and picked up the body of this dead criminal. This one had been condemned by all of Israel and, and by Rome. And gently, lovingly, maybe with the help of a, a servant or someone else nearby, carried him a distance off of Skull Hill and brought him to a beautiful little garden in the city of Jerusalem. The garden had a tomb that had been carved out of it, where Joseph, a wealthy man, a prominent man, would be buried in that city. He would be buried there. His family would be buried there. And the process was that as they dug a cave out, they would have a large stone about so tall that when it was time, they would roll that stone in front of the opening and it would block it off. Now the process that they would use for a body is that they would anoint that body with oils, with myrrh, with other things, and they would wrap that body in strips of cloth. Then they would take the body and they would set it on a, a kind of a bed carved out of stone also. You can still see them in Israel today and, and throughout the ancient world. And they would put the body there. Part of the aloe and the myrrh was meant to cover the smell of the decaying body. And then they would roll that stone that would seal the tomb and the body would decay. And when someone else in the family had died, they would roll that stone back and they would take the bones now that were left and they would get rid of the rest and they would put those bones in a, in a box, usually with a family name on it, a beautiful wooden box called an ossuary. And there they would put that box up on a shelf and then they would take maybe the man's wife, another prominent important person because of her connection to her husband and they would do the same lovingly, gently caring for her. And on it would go, the children, grandchildren, the whole family would be in that tomb. That was Joseph's plan until he finally said, no, something else is more important than what I wanted. Scripture tells us this way. If you want to look at your outline, it says Joseph of Arimathea, which is an area near Jerusalem. Prominent member of the council, that's the Sanhedrin, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. 
I want you to imagine what that was like for him as he has this beaten, almost unrecognizable body and begins to take it, take a cloth and dip it in water, begin to wipe the blood off of that face that had been scarred by those thorns, wiping the blood off of those wrists and arms. He didn't have much time. He didn't have time for a proper burial completely with all of the ointments, with all that they would do. Sundown was coming, and they were going into a new time of celebration, and he had to hurry. So he cleaned it best he could in a moment's notice, then took the linen, precious cloth that he had picked up very quickly in a market before they'd closed because the festivals were coming, and he began to gently wrap the body. I imagine this elderly man with his mind filled with thoughts, filled with the thoughts of what this young man that he's wrapping up and going to bury what that man was and what he had just done and what it was all about and how this man had so bravely stood up for what he believed and so gently healed people and cared for people and now was sort of the scourge of the world. And Joseph had knew, known who he was and hidden out of his fear and his weakness but wasn't going to hide anymore and as he wrapped up the body in linen... He knew that this was his way of honoring the Messiah. The word I want you to write down for the tomb is the word honor. Honor. Though it seems like a dark and a dreary place, it seems like the end of the line, the end of the hopes and dreams of who Jesus was and what he had done. It was a moment in history when the whole world had turned on the one who pleased the Father God the most. And he was now being honored. Not by a common person even. Not by a person like me. By a man who was well known throughout all of Israel. A man who'd finally humbled himself to lift up another, the Lord Jesus. And as he honored him, it wasn't just Joseph honoring him, but it was the Father who was speaking to Joseph, who was now honoring the sun at this moment, this dark moment, this moment that seemed like no one cared anymore. When you walk with Jesus and you find yourself in places that seem like you've been dishonored by the world around you, you need to know too that the Father has his ways of honoring you, of lifting you up, of embracing and loving you and caring for you. Though the world reject you, the Father will honor you. And he'll do it in ways beyond your wildest imagination. No one that afternoon would have guessed that a member of the Sanhedrin would be the one to care for the dead body of Jesus Christ. But it's not just this life that Jesus was honored, and it's not just this life that the Father will honor you. The scripture tells us very clearly over and over again. I've chosen one verse for us to look at, but let's read it together. The Bible tells us as we walk on this journey, it says now, if we are children, and that means God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Do you know what it means to be a co-heir? It means all that the Son receives, all that Jesus receives, we receive. We're equal. We're equal in our inheritance. All that he receives, if indeed we share in his, that's Jesus, sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. See, the whole world thought it ended with strips of cloth and a quick washing of blood and a, a stone that weighed a ton and a half or so being rolled down and sealed. They thought that was the end of the dream. It's all over now. It was a very dark two days for the few followers that Jesus had left at this point. A very dark two days. But the festivals ended. The celebrations ended. And early in the morning before the sun had even come up, there were some women. Women who knew who Jesus was. Women who had been ministered to and healed by Jesus. Women who had watched him being crucified and sobbed 
Women who'd followed Joseph of Arimathea and saw him being placed in Joseph's very own family tomb. Women who saw that quick cleaning and, and maybe even participated and saw Joseph wrap him in those strips of linen and seal the tomb. Women who saw that and who loved him passionately and who said over the next few days of that festival, as soon as the festival's over, we'll go back. We'll find someone to open the tomb for us and we'll, we'll anoint his body. We'll clean it properly. We'll anoint it properly. We'll rewrap it with those strips of fine linen and we'll, we'll mourn over him. And then they concealed the tomb again. And so the morning came. And those women got up very early. They gathered the spices and the anointing oil and the myrrh and all that they were going to use. Maybe even a little more linen. And they went back to the tomb that Joseph had put Jesus in. And the tomb was already open. They couldn't explain it. It shouldn't be open. But it was. And they didn't know where he was, and they peered inside, and they saw that shelf where the body should have been, where they saw it laid. And there was nothing there but the wrappings. They couldn't explain it. They didn't know what to do with it. But there was someone else there, an angel, who said, remember, over and over and over he told you that he had to be crucified, that the prophets said he would be crucified, and that that was the only way to rescue mankind from the ultimate results of their sin against the Father. Remember he told you that? And remember how he told you that after that happened, on the third day, he would rise from the dead? Remember how he told you that? And suddenly what seemed like the darkest moment in all of history became the brightest. Now the sun had really been honored. And the sun will be honored forever and ever and ever. And the scripture says that when the sun finally returns to right all wrongs, to bring in fullness the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, that anyone who's walked that journey with Jesus Christ also will share in all the same glory. And the whole world, even people who mocked, even people who rejected, even people who hated those who walk with Jesus, will have to stop and will have to look and will have to say, Jesus was real. Jesus is true. And there with Jesus is all of those people that walked on that journey with him forever and ever to live in the glory that Jesus lives in. That's what the scripture says. If we share in his sufferings, we'll share in his glory. Not just now, not just as we walk the journey on earth, but forever and ever and ever. This is why one of the greatest apostles who ever lived, a man named Paul, a man who agreed with Christians being killed early on. Then God got hold of him and turned him around and he began to tell about Jesus, the very one whom he'd killed followers of Jesus before. He was beaten and he was scourged and he was mocked and he was left for dead many times. And when people would ask him about that, his response was always this, you know, it's pretty light sufferings compared to the weight of glory we'll share with the Father forever. That's the glory that we have. That's the glory that Jesus lives in now and that we'll live in also. Though there's a cross to embrace, though there's a choice to be made, God is pleased and God provides with community and, and God honors along the way. I want to just pray for us and then we're going to close with a final song. As you're bowing your heads and you're just kind of letting all of this sort of sink in. The journey with Jesus begins with a step. And that step is to acknowledge that I too need Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. It's acknowledging that right now I stand outside of fellowship with God. That's not God's doing, it's my doing because of things I've done, because of how I've lived, because of just 
not a desire to walk with the Father. But then coming to a place where I say, no, I, I know that I need Jesus Christ. I know He died in my place. And I know that now if I receive Him as my Lord, I'll step into the glory of the Father, into the promise, into the blessing, and onto the journey. But today I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to commit my life to Him and step into His glory. Be born again, as Jesus called it. Enter a new life with Him that goes on forever in the glory of the Father. If you've never done that today, I want to invite you to do that. And you can do it just by a, a simple prayer. And just pray this way. Lord Jesus, I thank You for loving me. I thank You that You were willing to come to earth in the form of a man and die in my place on a cross. You were willing to face the results of my sins so that I might live in the results of your crucifixion. Thank you for the love that now comes to me as I trust you. Thank you for the reality that I no longer have to worry about sin or, or any of that, that you've dealt with that and I now stand as blameless before you. Thank you that you receive me now as your child, as your daughter, as your son, and that forever I live with you, and that though I walk this path with you and there's suffering along the way, there's also your glory, your honor, community, your blessing, your, your approval every step of the way. Today, Lord Jesus, I just give my life for you and thank you for the glory I now have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God, for this day. And Father, we who've already stepped onto this journey with you, praise you for all that Jesus did in our place. And now, Lord, it's in, in our thankfulness, our gratitude to you that we now want to embrace your will for us. Whatever that is today, Lord, we want to walk that out, knowing that you're with us every step of the way. Thank you, God, for Jesus, we pray in his holy name. Amen. Uh, God bless you guys today. If you brought a, a baby bottle uh, for the pregnancy care clinic offering, you leave it. Elise will be out there in the basket. You can leave it there. If you have kids, pick them up at the steps right outside of the fellowship hall. Uh, they'll be waiting for you there. Uh, most importantly, I guess, if today you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, I just want to celebrate with you. Love to hear about that decision. If you've got to get going, you can jot that down on an information card and just uh, leave it in one of the wooden boxes or with an usher on your way out. Would you stand? And I'm just going to close with a, a final prayer and then we'll be done today. Father, we bless you and we thank you for your great grace. We thank you for what Jesus Christ has done. We thank you for him dying in our place that we could have new life with you. Father, I thank you that in your love and your grace, you never leave us and you never forsake us. I just would pray over everyone here today, just the weight of your presence with them, the heaviness of your blessing, and the lightness of their spirit with peace and joy and love as you minister to them every step of the way today. Thank you, God, for your grace. We commit this day, we commit this hour to you now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great day today.